خیلی ممنون خیلی آقای دکتر حامد تفقی دوست مهندس امامیان هستن که در نورت کارولاینا هستن و ایشون به من معرفی کردم و من از مهندس امامیان خیلی متشکر هستم خیلی ممنون و دکتر تفقی ایژوکیشنشون پی اشتیشون رو از نورت وسترن یونیورسیتی باستان در یونیتی ستیت از 2014 گرفتن and MS در شریف یونیورسیتی آف تکنولوژی که آریا مهره خودمون در تهران در 2008 و بچلرشون شریف یونیورسیتی آف تکنولوژی دکتر تبخی از ان اسوشیت پروفیسور آف الیکترکال و کمپیوتر انجینیرینگ در یونیورسیتی آف نورت کارولاینا شارلوت is a director of the transformative computer system and architect research lab and um, he is um, researched his, his research is focused on novel technologies to bring recent advances in ai artificial intelligence and deep learning to enhance the safety and the security of our community physical and engineering system He leads millions of National Science Foundation Fund research grant on AI for public safety, learning and data analytic to enhance safety, health, and overall well-being of our community. Thank God someone is also looking to the safety. خیلی خیلی خوش آمدید آقای دکتر. واقعا افتخار دادید. جوان به این با سوادی And we're very proud of you. Dar, I guess share your screen, Doreen. It's open. And please welcome. And the floor is yours. <laughs> and you can speak English or Farsi, whatever you like. Oh, man, just some Farsi. I will be happy. Salam arz bokonam. Merci ke man davat kari. Mamnoon bovate mogadame va introduction. Hamushi koftam man tuye zamnoy mukhafi safety va. ترانسپورتیشن و اپلیکیشن مختلف ای آی کار میکنم ولی خصوصا توی چند سال اخیر حالا خیلی دغدغه ای آی برای هلس کرم دارم و چند تا پروژه هستش که خوشحال میشم راجبش صحبت کنم امروز و همینطور راجب کلیات ای آی کلا پرزنتیشن من جوریه که هر وقت خواستین میتونید منو انتراب کنین و اگه سوالی داشته خیلی خوشحال میشم آنستی uh, فکر کنم نمیدونم حالا فارسی باید بگم یا انگلیسی چون من خودم ترجم شخصا ترجم نم فارسی صحبت کنم ولی هیچ وقت به یاد نمیارم توی حداقل اقل ده پونزه سال اخری که یه مطلب علمی رو فارسی گفته باشم دارشته. که برای خودم هم چلنج جاله میخواد بود نمیدونم احتمالا یه ترکیبی از فارسی و انگلیسی میرم ولی یه جوری میکنم که فارسی هم قصابی نشه یعنی یا انگلیسی باشه یا فارسی باشه قومتون برم من اسکرین هم رو شر کنم با همه I organized this presentation and such that first I'm going to talk about briefly about AI and what is our perception of AI. I know this community, to my understanding, uh, is an educated community coming from mostly healthcare and medicine. So I'm not sure what is the level of understanding about AI, but I would be, I, I felt that it would, it might be interesting for everybody to have a more understanding of AI and applications of AI. Also, I forgot to apologize. I have a minor cold, so you see my voice is kind of funky. Sorry for that. It was very unexpected. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess um, one of the movies that I, when I was a child back in Iran that uh, I saw and really inspired me was movie AI. by Steven Spielberg. I don't know, I assume that some of you have seen that movie. It kind of inspired me to take this journey of, you know, computer engineering, computer science, and doing AI. Even back then, I didn't know what is AI exactly. It just sounds cool. So, <laughs> so I started doing that. And the idea of that movie was that there is this child that is acting like normal humans. And uh, this child is also emotional. It has self-awareness and has all these senses. Uh, and that 
impose a challenge to the entire family and society, right? That uh, what is an AI and uh, what do we mean with intelligent systems or artificial intelligence? So the movie of the AI was a much, much more realistic uh, and more human-centric definition of AI. But the way that we're using AI these days in our society and in our communities is kind of different. And I would like to talk about that. And, and then we dive into the health here as well. Uh, so, uh, so as far as we know, we are... Uh, we are most advanced intelligent species on planet. We don't know about other planets. And the reason we are assumed that we are intelligent is uh, because we are able to gain knowledge from the environment and uh, get this passive knowledge and make it into an active knowledge and create new knowledge or new information. And, and that has been the engine power of whole humanity and through generations, you know, we were able to pass this knowledge and build wealth and, you know, and advanced science, engineering and understanding the universe and uh, building civilizations. And all of this coming from our brain, basically, there's no other biological elements in our human body that to our understanding does information processing. So our brain somehow is capable of uh, doing all these creations and fuel all these creations and uh, and still the core science of what makes us human uh, is kind of mysterious why ships are not at least half as smart as humans why they are more dumb than us but uh, that's kind of inspired a lot of computer scientists and generally we humans, we look at the nature and we get inspired by nature and then we try to simulate or emulate near nature. Same way we develop airplanes, right? So we look at our brains and through MIR imaging and other imaging technologies, we try to understand what are these neurons and how they are connected. And, and then we, computer scientists and engineers, try to replicate that to make AI, perhaps. But at principle, and I guess you guys know a lot better than me, that our brain has billions or more than billions of neurons, that they are interconnected with each other, and then we have synapses and connections, and uh, and then we are able to do all this visual perception, reasoning, uh, language, all of that creation, all of that, and kind of hidden within that, you know, environment of billions of neurons being connected with each other. Uh, <clears throat> so to build such a system, uh, and I, I'm giving some history, that's building some artificial model of humans. So that was the source of creating AI. So in 50s, let's say Turing, when he got inspired by AI, philosophically is one of the first true science, computer scientists who uh, pioneered many principles in computer science and AI. The idea back then of an AI system was exactly that, building an artificial neuron system that basically emulates and imitate human behaviors as such that if you are, as a human, having a conversation with it, you don't recognize the difference between human and an uh, artificial system. Uh, and that was the Turing test for AI. So we, we could say that an AI system is a system that can pass Turing test, which is a very old model, but it's kind of started by Turing in the 50s. Um, and throughout the history, AI has been kind of a buzzword. Basically, generally, what we mean with AI means uh, an artificial system that is intelligent. and can mimic human behaviors. But in fact, the term of AI is far broader than that. And if we want to really look, at, look into AI more from the scientific and engineering principle, AI is much broader term, especially when we try to materialize or realize AI, we come to a field that we call it machine learning. And machine learning basically is the science and engineering of learning information from data and experiences. So what makes us, again, very unique as an intelligent system is our capability to learn from experiences and from information and data. So the question is that how we can add learning capabilities to the machines. 
And in this case, with machines, we mean computer systems, and which can expand it to robots as well, but we're going to briefly talk about that later on. And, uh, and science, basically, doing artificial intelligence is basically doing the science of learning. How to build a system that is not hardwired to do a specific task, rather is designed as such that it learns by itself from example and experiences, which is uh, basically core science of AI. And if we're going to get very closer and better understand why in the last 10 years, everybody's talking about AI, we see this resurgence of AI, a topic that used to be around since, since 50s. But in the last 10 years, and maybe last few years, we hear far more about AI. It's because of a new discovery. And it's truly a discovery than an engineering um, principle is uh, deep learning emergence of deep learning. And basically the core engine of modern AI is deep learning and, uh, and machine learning is deep learning. And the idea of deep learning is, um, so traditionally, if you ask machine learning engineers, they were always thinking about complex algorithms that are capable of learning. But with the deep learning phenomena, what we learn is that if you just build a very complex chain of neural networks, many of them stacked together, and you build basically a deep network of neurons. And in this case, your neurons are artificial neurons or just piece of program, you know, which imitate or emulate human neuron behavior. And you have enough compute power and enough data, which thanks to internet, social media, we have those and compute power times for advances in semiconductor technology. We have far more compute power. Then you don't need to do much more than that. The system is going to learn by itself. That's it. So just build a very deep chain of artificial neurons, largely stacked, billions of neurons, something very comparable to human brain size and how many neurons we have. And just pass the data through them. You know, just you have unlimited compute power to just compute all this data and information. And let the system train by itself. Don't try to intervene that system that much. That by itself is going to learn the objective function and going to learn. And modern, modern AI, it's even capable of reasoning. So I'm not saying that that system is conscious or self-aware or sentient, but that's why a lot of AI scientists are freaking out this age because we are not doing that much engineering. It's more like a discovery, it's emergent phenomena that if you build a very deep, large network of neurons, artificial neurons, as long as you have enough compute power, that system is able to learn by itself. Just let it train. <laughs> and that can be very exciting and it's scary at the same time. I'm going to touch that topic later on when I talk about ChatGPT and its impact in healthcare. So with that, uh, of course, AI can have many different applications, you know, computer vision, social media, you see a Snapchat, you see Instagram, all these filters that we are seeing these days are popping up. Uh, and of course, deepfake, all of them are using neural networks and modern AI. and when I mean neural network and modern AI, what I mean is deep learning. Deep learning is the key word. So deep learning is powering all this new excitement about AI. Um, basically, AI community, in a community we don't call it AI, we call it deep learning community, in fact. Um, so other applications, language models, I mean, uh, of course, chat GPT since last year when it was released by OpenAI, although at core is not a scientific breakthrough or engineering breakthrough, but what was key about chat GPT was bringing AI to people, to general public. So there is far more awareness of power of AI uh, right now in all communities and uh, to general public, something that we didn't have before. I was just curious how many, I mean, I don't know if we have a capability of raising hands here, but I'm just curious that how many have used ChatGPT already? I can see a few already. Okay. So clearly a lot. Okay. 
uh, that's um, I'm not surprised. And that's um, me, myself, you know, uh, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I mean, I have been professor here for seven years. I have been doing something as I have been doing in the last seven years, but just in the last six, seven months, I have had at least six, seven TV interviews with local TV stations coming to me and asking about AI and chat GPT. And the only reason is because chat GPT brought AI to public and public could use that for their daily, you know, problems, something that we didn't have before. So that was a, uh, through innovation of open AI, in fact. Um, of course, robotics, you know, self-driving cars, which all started with a DARPA challenge in early 2000, and now we're getting their service robots, you know, and then uh, you guys know Tesla is working for a much more advanced service robot that looks like human. These are all great application of AI. The one that we are focusing today uh, is healthcare. It can be robotics, you know, could be uh, healthcare assistance systems that are, looks very futuristic. But after COVID, we saw clearly a shortage of nurses in our nursing homes. Uh, and potentially AI robotic can be very helpful. We are having a silver wave in US, in American society and across the world that the population is getting older and uh, we are not having as many workforce that we used to have. So the question is that, and many of these, you know, nursing homes, assisted living homes are suffering right now. And the question is how we can, you know, cope with this rapid growth in older adult population. And of course, that's one key application that I'm gonna talk about it more. Uh, of course, medical imaging, MRI imaging, you know, sometimes AI, especially when it comes to the imaging is becoming much more intelligent than us as humans and is able to capture subtle changes in our MRI images and, uh, and definitely can help, you know, physicians and healthcare professionals uh, with much higher accuracy to identify the problem or help them with their medication or interventions as well. Uh, and there's another one, CD scan that, you know, you may have different type of infections and maybe uh, maybe not. Actually, people are, have developed this kind of technologies that AI can help you to say whether, what kind of COVID it is or it is COVID or not. Uh, and of course, the one that I'm also very excited about is uh, drug discovery where you can, uh, and there's a company, uh, the name of the company is uh, DeepMind. I don't know if you guys have heard of it or not, which they are very active in this um, in this field of uh, drug discovery. And uh, they, have, they were already able to encode entire human protein, which is a breakthrough and can help us to discover drugs for building cancers, you know, and even discover and build personalized medicines, which is very important. Uh, who knows, maybe our generation is the one that can live much, much longer if you want to, because maybe we identify the genes that are responsible for aging and find a cure for them or find a way to stop aging process, which is becoming a predominant issues in, for human species. Uh, I'm gonna talk about all of, uh, some of these aspects a little bit more further, but uh, before diving into more details, in general, in healthcare, we have not seen as much progress than other fields. Let's say self-driving cars, we have seen so much, much more advances. Let's say uh, in social media, you see a lot of AI is being used. Uh, most of the income of Google or Facebook meta is coming from ads and personalized ads and engaging users. And all of that is powered by AI engines that show you the content that you want to see because they have already model or personality because we as a human are not unique. So overall there is finite states for humans. And if you model them and you learn what they want to see or what they want to shop, then you can start to, you know, send them proper ads or content. And that's the core business model of a lot of big tech that behind that is AI. 
just one of the reason that we don't see that much advances in healthcare yet, but it's going to happen uh, within the next few years. It was lack of data because in healthcare, we always have a concern about privacy and most of the hospitals and healthcare professionals have their own limited data sets and that limits uh, uh, potentials of AI because for AI training, we need much more data which I'm going to talk about it more. But I just want to add one more thing before moving to the next one is that uh, uh, it's very important to understand the role of training data. If when I talk about the deep learning and I talk about this deep learning networks, learning by just stacking, you know, giant amounts of neurons, artificial neurons, and let them to train by themselves, the only restriction for that system to work is data. So you need to have a very large volume of data to train those systems. And in many fields, we don't have that yet. And that's the limitation. Otherwise, we basically already decode the algorithmic problem. We even already decoded the or cracked the computing problem. What is stopping us to advance in many fields is just not having sufficient training data. So, uh, so to address that, I'm going to discuss about uh, a research project that I'm doing in UNC. I actually we are working with multiple hospitals as well. I mean, I am I was fortunate that I'm working with a colleague that he has more healthcare background. So we are building this framework. Uh, this framework is being kind of supported by, by both National Science Foundation and NIH, National Institute of Health. It is within the university research capacity, so it's not a product, you know, it's just doing a research is a lot different than a product development. It may take five to 10 years to come to the market. I don't know how long, but I don't mind to give you all a brief overview of this work to add some of the data gaps problem that we see in healthcare. And then and then after that, I'm going to briefly talk about the product that we are developing as part of a company that I'm involved with. Um, hopefully you 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 all can find it helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I call it federated AI learning and inference for healthcare. And uh, by federated learning we mean that how we can enable AI system to learn from many examples without the need to sharing those information with everyone. So how we can pro protect the privacy of our patients or residents or citizens, but at the same time, have the benefits of AI by enabling this data to be used for training. <laughs> so before, before uh, diving to details, I want to just I put this overview slides because I feel like it's very insightful to, in a more visual way, communicate with you all how we train these modern AIs or how, let's say, Chat GPT like AI models being trained. So in this case, this figure is exactly inspired by large language models and Chat GPT. Basically, this is how these systems are being made. Um, so in this case, we have, uh, uh, by the way, large language models or language models, basically conversational AI, the one that you can talk, ask them to write an essay for you or write your emails or give you a recommendation for a trip, all these daily interactions that we may have with ChatGPT. Um, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So you may say that what is a transformer? and I just put it a transformer encoder, that transformer is nothing rather than just that giant, many layered stack of neural, artificial neurons, which we call artificial neural networks, but deeply chained. We call that transformer. So that's that black box that we don't wanna open that black box. We're gonna leave it as it is. The only thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna guide that black box, which is nothing rather than this giant stack of neurons to learn reasoning. So 
what I think inspire all of you if you have interacted with GPT is that, oh, it's so great in reasoning. And in past, we, I personally thought that we are not there. The science of reasoning is a very complex science that would take centuries for us to, you know, to crack that and build an artificial system that can do human level reasoning. But it turns out to a discovery, I call it discovery because it was not engineered to be like that. It turns out through a basic test that maybe reasoning is not as complex as what we thought. Maybe reasoning is an emergent phenomenon, something that emerged from learning. It's not necessarily inherent part of learning. And what was that test? And this is how GPTs are being trained, such as chat GPT. Let's say in the language models, the way you train these neural networks is that you go and collect old literature and documents, blogs, write-ups that have been written throughout the human history, which thanks to internet, you have access to all of them. And then you collect all of them, put them together, and then you separate them into a frame of you know sentences, one sentence, two sentences, you know, you just you just cure your data set, you just form them into a well-structured inform chain of information. And what you do is that you give some of the word per sentence, and just you mask some of them. In this case, you mask this word. Sorry, this word as well. So I know this word is boring, but I mask it. I don't fit it to my network. I don't fit it to my transformer. So I feed other words, but I mask a couple of them randomly. In this case, in mask means the word that has been masked, which is boring. And I ask my transformer encoder, which is nothing rather than this giant deep learning network, to predict the missing word. And the beauty here is that I already know what is the missing word. It's not an unknown mystery for me. I know it's boring, but I, by design, intentionally decide to not give the boring to my network. So it gives partial information to my network, to my transformer, and asks my network transformer to predict the missing information for me, which I already know what are the correct answer for that. That's why I call it self-supervised learning. Basically, these models can learn with themselves. You can just write a program that randomly masks some of the words and ask the network to predict those missing words. Of course, the network would not come with the right answer. But if you iterate it many times throughout all the literature that have been written in human history, after weeks or months of training on giant warehouses that only Facebook and Google and Meta have, over time, your network learns what are the missing words. And it's extremely powerful to, to predict any randomly missed word. And it turns out if your network is capable of predicting the missing word in the document, that network, that AI system has reasoning, learn reasoning over language. That's why now you can interact with GPT, ask questions. It has not specifically trained to answer your questions. It just trained to do reasoning. But since it has learned reasoning over languages, now you can have a conversation with it. And since it has already mastered the skill set of reasoning over language, it can answer any questions, can do different tasks for you guys. The task that it has not even necessarily trained for it. And that's exciting and scary at the same time. The exciting part is that there is no magic science in reasoning. You just need tremendous amount of data and tremendous amount of computing and capital money and then through them and then start to randomly mask information and ask the AI to predict those. And through many iterations, it's going to learn reasoning. So that sounds uh, scary, but at the same time, very exciting. 
because now maybe we can have an AI that write a, as better than as Shakespeare, or I mean, has not trained in Farsi yet, but I tried to use ChatGPT to do Persian poetry. It was not that great, but it did a decent job, in fact. Uh, so the question is, by knowing that, by having that discovery in the last few years, and this is what I'm passionate about, how we can bring that reasoning from language to healthcare? How we can bring that level of reasoning that goes beyond human capability to healthcare that hopefully can lead to discoveries that we humans would not able to achieve because we are limited by our biological needs and our time and or you know or brain size and how much we can compute. Um, so just one example that uh, me and my colleague are working on is the same idea. Let's say in this case, we we're working in retinal imaging for eyes, but you can do it for uh, MRI, for CD scan, is that we are collecting, working with some hospitals, clinics, we are building some toy examples that we get these images and then we really divide these images to small patches of information and then feed some of them to our transformer, which we call it in this case, iBert. And we ask our transformer to predict missing words. Uh, and maybe this shows this even better. We ask, uh, no, I don't have it. Anyway, we ask our transformer to predict missing word. And why just and we already received good results. It's not the scary results yet, the scary good yet, but it's a lot better than the classical deep learning. So it shows that this science of uh, uh, masking and collecting huge amount of information and going through many training iteration is working not only for languages, can be used for other modalities. In this example, biomedical imaging. Uh, so, but but at the same time, the limitation we have is that, and I know federal government has started this initiative to create this uh, federally collect, collected data set for healthcare, but I don't know how long this is going to take and how much hospitals and every clinic is willing to collaborate or cooperate with it. But we have started to work with a few hospitals here and clinics is that so now the framework that we are building is more federated. And that's the federation part coming to the picture that we are building a system that uh, each hospital and each clinic can keep their own data locally rather than sending the data to a centralized server to do this centralized training. What we are doing is we push the training to each hospital. So we, we learn from each hospital, we, then we return back the learned knowledge to our server. We learn from this hospital, we return back the learned knowledge from this hospital, and then we use novel techniques. I don't want to get there right now. It might be beyond the time that we have here to combine this learned knowledge from each hospital to build this collective knowledge. So that's where the federation and federated learning come into the picture. So it's an approach to break this barrier and address the data gap that we have in healthcare. And enable each hospital and clinic maintain their own data. They don't need to share those information. But at the same time, we can learn from those data and collectively learn across many hospitals. So hopefully we can have a GPT-like AI for, let's say, imaging. And that can be, if we show that this principle is working, they can be expanded to a lot of other healthcare related fields. Let's say that's the bigger vision that we are selling, right? Uh, and we are hoping to develop and we already have some uh, good results and some early publications that we shared with research communities. And hopefully we have a couple of pending proposals. So hopefully we get more funding to continue development of this. Uh, I don't know. Um, whether how much, I guess I have more time, am I right? Yes, you do have time. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So I, I, I wanna move to another direction, something more practical, because I feel like this, this is more research, very, very theoretical, more core AI, but 
I don't know how much it was related, but before going to the next topic, which is more practical, do you do you all have any question for me? I would be more than happy to answer any question here. Question number one. Sure. What is a machine neuron? What is it made of? Is it microchip or what is it? It's just a software. It runs on the traditional chips. It's just it's a, a software. software. Yes. Okay. When you mask a word, for instance, your own sentence, the movie was very boring. Okay. How machine does how does machine know that movie was very boring and not very interesting? So very good question. I love that. Um, because this is not the only sentence that machine sees. You know, I show a very isolated example. Imagine this machine or is this piece of software is much larger, right? So the usually the window size that they get is not, let's say in this case, is what seven words. The window size of chat GPT is 3,000 words. So every time you feed 3,000 words and you add randomly mask some of the words. Mm -hmm. So they have enough context and information to do sufficient reasoning to know that based on the context, based on the prior sentences and future sentences, whether it should be boring or interesting. And that's why we are pushing these machines to do reasoning by themselves. So the deep learning will tell the machine what the real answer is. Uh, I'm not saying telling may not be the right word. Deep learning uh, empower them to discover empower the right them. answer okay. over many iterations. Okay, let me look at my notes. And uh, thank you. Of course, you answered um, my question. that was a great question. Yeah, thank so you. I really, I really oversimplify it. So it's not seven words and then, hey, I only have these seven words telling you, tell me what is the mask word or missing word. You usually give thousands of words at the same time and you mask few of them and the network has to discover those. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Khanu Madani, Dr. Hamed Tabakhi. قبلا ما جدول ضرب حرف میکردیم تو کالج بودیم کلکولیتر استفاده نمیکردیم از موقعی که سلفون اومده دیگه شماره تلفن خودمون هم یادم نمیاد الان مدتی هست از چت جی تی بی چت جی تی پی فور استفاده میکنیم تمام نامه ها رو می که منویسم خیلی قشنگ جواب میده اما مغزم دیگه من استفاده نمی کنم I become a brain dead What's the answer? That, that's a very good answer uh, It's a machine yeah. We're supposed to have a technology for simplification Alan, I think like it's going to be complicated uh, that's a very good question. But let me take an answer to that because I, I have a passion for impact of AI society. Is, and if you search my name, you see I have a lot of work related to AI and human interaction. And actually, I'm advising a couple of students from public policy and social science to exactly um, study the, those unintended consequences that you are talking about. The question is, I don't know, you guys may have seen there's an animation, Wall E, that shows that few, it's, it's very futuristic. It shows that future humans are not, are dumb, basically. <laughs> because AI is taking care of everything, so you really don't need to do anything. And then you just, you just, we're going to be like pets for AI, right? That, look at how much or pets or dogs have understanding of their environment compared to the owner that we are. And who knows, maybe a dog thinks that we they are the owner and we are serving them, you know, within their own bubble, right? Uh, so if we really don't have uh, good policies, we may end up to be those dogs um, and AI pet us, all of us. And we're just happy just eating and going playing, you know, and playing games. Um, but and the problem could be worse than that because uh, right now with uh, aging population, uh, beyond the Alzheimer, we see uh, more rapid growth in cognitive decline. And 
if we are starting to not challenge our brain, right, that may even further exacerbate the cognitive decline in humans. Um, that's also a problem. Um, we have never faced, so as you said, we always used to leave the mundane tasks for AI, but if AI can do reasoning, then that's the major task of human species, creativity. If AI becomes more creative than we are, the question is that where is good to use it, where is not good to use it? And we need to select and that needs to be regulated by us and policymakers, I guess. I mean, we all love to see AI discover the cure for cancer, right? Or help us with aging, right? Maybe we all can live a lot longer than is expected lifetime of humans. These are not the bad ideas. But the question is how we can benefit from those by the same time uh, mitigate the side effects, these unintended consequences. Honestly, I don't know what is the right answer for that, but I feel that the society as a whole and research community as a whole has started to think about it. And uh, and that maybe some of that is our own personal responsibility that uh, we play chess not because we need we need to make money. We just play chess because it's fun and it's also engage our brain, right? Maybe you want to write some emails not because AI is maybe not because uh, they, you want to write emails because you want to challenge yourself mentally and cognitively. Um, although you still have chat GPT access and can chat GPT can write it a lot better than you, you still rather want to write it yourself. And I do it myself personally. Sometimes I feel that like I want to write it myself to see how good I am writing compared to chat GPT. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be, <laughs> these are all, you know, unintended consequences that we're going Thank to have. You. Thank you sure. very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tapri. Very fascinating <laughs> presentation. Um, my question is, when you're talking about this reasoning, how could you mm, trust your encoder to, to give a good reason? For example, if a leader, if a crazy leader decide to do something crazy in the world, um, and the bunch of um, people who are helping him or guiding him, um, they are going to stop him, but they cannot. And then they'll just say, okay, go and ask the chat GPT to tell us what's the best solution. Um, how could you trust that? You're not having the full book of Descartes, for example, for reasoning up there. So um, how could you trust that? I feel like at the end of the day, for critical decisions, you don't want to trust any AI system. And I don't think I've, I've worked in a lot of safety systems. I never trust AI. And in our protocol and policies, we say that never trust AI. In this case, trust AI is more like an assistive technology that helps you to come with the right decision, but human has to be in the loop. And in those cases, as societal decisions as a whole, I feel like you have to rely on democracy and collective human decisions, even though that might be wrong. Can you um, use AI in uh, Code Blue, for example, in healthcare um, system? Can you trust that instead of physician or their, um, when they have to give epinephrine or when they have to give lidocaine or what, but so on? Not right now, but at some point you can. And the question is, and that's the motivation of this idea is that, in many cases, if you live in rural areas, if you live in underserved communities, if you live in third world country, you don't have access to that high-end healthcare professional, right? That's it. So, so that's where AI can help us a lot to reduce the cost, to provide mm -hmm. higher access. So everywhere, no matter where you live, you will still have almost have the same quality. And uh, I think those are the benefits we are looking for. If, but if someone has access to in-person, high-end healthcare professional, of course, they they can they should go and see that person. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily replacement. It's more like a more even distribution of wealth and access uh, to everyone. That's oh. that can be a big outcome of AI. Yes. Right. How could you <clears throat> control the QI? Um... Um, quality improvement, for example, how much, how could you um, collect data for mortality, for example, for the AI uh, mistake during the code, for example? Um, 
So we are not there yet because we are not using AI for decision making, right? And again, at the end of the day, we never going to use AI for decision making. Even in healthcare, AI is going to be assistive technology. Thank it's going to help and drive, sure, physicians mm -hmm. to make a better decision. But I just want to say something in general that I am highly advocate is that let's say for self-driving cars, I'm sure if we have self-driving cars, we are still going to have mortalities caused by AI. But you know how many people we die every year? 30,000. Yes. I don't think we would have 30,000 deaths per year if we mm -hmm. remove all these cars and replace them with self-driving cars. There yeah. is still going to be some disasters, some mistakes by AI. But I feel that for some of that task, I would really trust AI a lot more than humans. So you give a lot of advantages rather than disadvantages. Yes. Okay, thank you. I am definitely sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I am definitely a proponent of AI, but I, I am at the same time not ignorant. I am well aware of the dangers, and this is what we are working on. There are definitely some concerns that need to be addressed over time. Of course. Thank you very much. Of course. I, uh, Jordan, I think, you know, when there's, there's a code, let's say a patient's uh, EKG shows whatever, uh, ventricular arrhythmia or code, whatever. If AI can read it and say, these are the recommendation of medication and the Absolutely. dose is this. Absolutely. Instead of, I used to be memorizing that and run the course. Yes. And, okay. Yes. So the, you know, the mistake would maybe would be even less because- Much lesser than human Or being. maybe the syringe would be uh, measured by the AI system so if the mm -hmm. dose would be correct and it's just one, two, three, you know, go shot. And if this doesn't work, use the, um, uh, the feb defibrillator or whatever. It, if it's feed well, it yeah. can help in, especially in cold blue. Mm. And, um, it's fascinating. <clears throat> when we had a Pixis, which is a pharma, uh, pharmacy uh, in AI, it was fascinating and was very helpful, very helpful, unless uh, mistakes happen. So I can imagine, yes, now I understand it's fascinating to have AI actually during the call. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Tapti. Uh, my question is about uh, transformer encoder that you showed in, on your yes. language model. Uh, uh, I wonder how this transformer encoder works and how can you make that is it simply uh, using a database and uh, it goes to the database and uh, and uh, makes the decision or is it a, a set of uh, uh, printed <laughs> circuits computer circuits what is it and how so let's made so let's do a Google search together. Do you guys see my browser? Yes. Transformer encoder architecture. What is inside it? Encoder is misspelled. Okay. So, oh yeah. So so if you ask Bing, right, which is connected to Chat GPT, it gives you a very scientific definition of that. But I'm trying to find a good image. That's why I try to hide that. Um, maybe that's a good one. That's the, it says you see encoder blocks. Let me tell you what is inside an encoder block. Uh, in neural networks. Uh, so, you see, people are abstracted a lot because it's going to be a lot more complicated, but maybe I can show it in this figure. So it's not necessarily a database or it's not necessarily... A... Okay. I have to refer to one of my own paper, but I'm going to show you guys this one. Is... Um... Let me just show you guys neural networks. Maybe that helps. So you see that this is a neural network. Mm. This is a deep neural network. So you have nodes. The nodes have been abstract and they are connected with each other. So this is a neural network with four layers, which has one input layer and three hidden layers. So you may ask me, okay, Hamid, what are these nodes? 
I would say that these nodes, think about these are artificial neurons inspired by human bio biological neurons. They have synapses and they, they receive inputs, input synapses, and they fire an output. And, uh, and they are acting like a spiking neuron. So they receive inputs, they do the linear algebra, they average over the inputs. And if the input passes a certain threshold, they spike the output. So it turns out if you stack them, many of them, and I'm not talking about four layers, I'm talking about hundreds, if not thousands of layers of neurons, that's become your transformer encoder. That's something that learns to reason and predict the missing words in the case of ChatGPT. And you may say that, okay, how do you build that? Do you build a chip for this? No, it's just a software. The software simulate, that's the power of software. The software simulate or mimic this kind of architecture. And then this maps to a normal CPU or GPU. So you don't need to build a hardware. It's just a software that models this architecture. So it's basically a software. Yes, it's all software. Amazingly, it's all software. Wow. Are these software uh, open source? Are they or are they? Uh, yes, there are many of them are open source. So let's say I am I am in University of North Carolina now. All everything we do because it's taxpayer money or research, right? Re research money you open source them is open to public. Anybody can have access to that hmm. for the research. Of course, I am a researcher, right? I'm not, you know. A, I don't run a big corporation, but if you talk to Google or OpenAI or Facebook, they don't have their own, they have their own proprietary software. They don't open source. It. But from the, on, on the research side, they're all open and available to public. Okay, thank you. You opened sure. the Pandora box. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's the Pandora box. <laughs> You guys actually pushed me to open it up. <laughs> I want to stay <laughs> away from it, but it didn't work. Interesting <laughs> question. Uh, uh, thank you so much for all those information, even though I need a AI for dummy because <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> but I have a question. When the <clears throat> AI get involved with the medicine, uh, they can uh, choose the dosage of the medicine too, or the doctors involved? Uh, we are working to choose the dosage. We are not there yet. So our idea here is that they provide recommendation. Again, when we say that AI does the reasoning, reasoning is not equal to decision-making, but they can do reasoning and choose or recommend the dosage as well. And then that's the, that's the judgment would be by a physician or healthcare professional. But in this case, let's say, you may have not seen some certain cases, right? And then by de deploying this federated learning idea that we are developing here, you would have basically access to all knowledge or recommendations across all the physicians and healthcare professionals around the world. So it make your decision making a lot more consistent with the rest of population, with the rest of you know healthcare professionals and experts. And then you may say that, Hamad, I live in California and I am I have access to a set of the art technology and I know what I'm doing, which is great, but maybe someone in Venezuela doesn't have that. Now, he or she would benefit from the same level of care, hopefully, at least comparable to what we can offer in more wealthier societies. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, and um, Mr. Farzin, and good questions. Yeah, so, uh, I have two questions. One, um, reasoning versus uh, creativity. So to what extent um, would we expect creativity? Uh, and the other question is um, data. So uh, we collect data on certain things, but we don't collect data on other things. So doesn't this process end up accentuating the biases of how we collect data? And isn't that 
a, an area of concern that needs to be addressed really at the get-go. Oh, so yeah. Can... You... yeah. Sorry for interrupting. That was a great question. Yes, that's the problem. That's the problem that the, when we collect the data partially, this is going to add biases to the system. I'm going to skew the entire decision-making process. So I serve your second question. Let's say, uh, let's say a lot of cases, uh, we, let's say even different diseases, and this is not my background. I know that because we often look at the people that develop a certain kind of cancer, we often know what caused this, but we don't know exactly what doesn't cause this or all of our judgment and our, or this decision-making might be biased based on the observation we see. Um, that's a very important and big challenge in healthcare. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I believe we can do a lot more than the data that we already collect from each, each hospital uh, compared to what we are doing right now. So EMR right now, now every hospital, they are digitalizing the healthcare information, right? So right. it's not anymore, you know. So that's by itself is the greatest step. But the question is that even with the current healthcare information that we have, you know, health, you know, the background that they had, they do physical every year. We have their blood tests, some basic, you know, results, and then they may develop different diseases or diagnoses or different medication, the response to different medications. All of this information, even the level that we collect right now, imagine if we, I build or we build, not me, the society build AI system that can have access to all of them in a privacy preserving manner and then feed them to a chat GPT like model. How many discoveries we can have beyond you know what we have achieved so far? And of course, there are still going to be biases there. I'm not denying that, which we should be aware of it. If we need to enhance our data collection. But overall, in healthcare, we are not doing that much AI right now, in fact. I have one question. We have different server of EMR. There's supposed to be one, then they could read each other. But at least in Los Angeles, we have like Epic and then something else. And so on. Is that a problem for you guys that you're trying to feed uh, so, uh, that it's not one system that's a problem so if you notice you know because i'm active in a startup environment actually i know few startups some of them are funded by iranians that are trying to address exactly that problem to coming with a standard model for helping hospitals to just exchange the emr information or data uh, but uh, what we are trying to do in this model is rather than you guys need to share your data with someone else, we push the training to you guys. So right. the idea here is that each each hospital is going to be AI trained inside, but then with the train model is going to be shared by other hospitals. And that train model has a standard format, which is completely identified. Oh. You see what I'm talking about? Right. Right. Because you know, I know because of all this data and data collection, the physicians, some of them tell me the young physicians that they are um they take their laptop home and finish the patients that they saw all the data to put in to 2 a.m., 1 a.m. for the patient yeah. they saw in the daytime. And then the yeah. way the system is now. Um, like this healthcare companies, they push, you know, see a patient, new patient every 20 minutes and five minutes for their follow-up. And so they don't have time to finish all this page, pages and pages. So they take it home. And yeah. then, so it's been really difficult on the physicians. So but my next, my next presentation, I mean, I, if you have follow-up, I'd like to go through it. Otherwise, I can stop it here. They're exactly going to address that problem. Okay. That you mentioned. Go ahead. Please. Which is, 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 I'm going to be extremely quick here. Is, it's not any more research. This is more like a product. Uh, Foresight Cares, we are active in North Carolina. Um, uh, it's incorporated. So we are focusing on accessible AI for active, healthy aging of older adults. This is our website. And what is our product? I mean, rather than me just talking about it, we have a video demo of this product that you guys can see it. 
basically is an AI app that uses computer vision and try to do some routine ex health assessment that often healthcare professionals and physicians don't have time to do it. Let's say one example we were talking, I was listening to about squatting, you know, is a chair rise. Chair rise is a very important test provided by CDC for, let's say it's very important for fall risk assessment. What do you see this, this older adult is performing chair rise in front of the app. App uses the building camera and just build a 3D dimensional digital twin of that person on the fly in real time on his iPad that is here. So that's our person. That's the that's a caregiver in this case. This is the iPad. So this is a standard test of uh, cherry rice, which is recommended for fall risk assessment and broader, you know, mobility assessment for active healthy aging of older adults. Typically, CDC mandate, you know, uh, sorry, CMS mandate fall risk assessment once per year for older adults 65 plus, which as you said many cases, healthcare professionals don't have time for it. It's not a priority. They just ask you, what have you felt before in the last year? If they're not, then that's good. You're good. Basically, older adults generally feel that they're not going to fall till they fall. And if they fall, then the consequences often are bad. It leads to the hip surgery. And if you go through the hip surgery, then a lot of older adults uh, end up in the nursing homes. So the question is that how we can push preventative healthcare using AI and again, bringing access to everybody and AI do a lot of assessment more regularly and more routinely when the physicians don't have time or when insurance companies are robbing us and charging us a lot for every assessment. Uh, and that's why this is important because that can help us for a lot of preventative health practices. And a lot of these assessments can be done at home with a loved one or caregiver without direct supervision of, exactly, that's the key, without the direct supervision of the healthcare professional. And the system record all this information, you know, and it can go forward and just basically score them, with, let's say how many they did, what is your knee bending, what is your hip bending. You can do the gait analysis as well, talk test, you know, that's that. I mean, time of hango, I don't know you guys have heard of it or family of it or not. But yeah, it's another important test. And we know gait is very important for active healthy aging. If you look at someone gait, you can learn a lot about them and then can provide all this information about the gait. And they, they can track their progress over time. We can set personalized goals for them. That's the app. That's the product that we have right now. It's in the market kind of. It is at the demo stage, but we are running limited pilots with a uh, few uh, independent living communities in North Carolina and uh, Ohio. These are one of examples. Uh, we are also uh, spreading to UPDRS, which is for Parkinson. You know, for Parkinson, uh, reaction to, if there are neurologists here, they, they know better than me that the reaction to uh, medication is very important and on all and off states, the states that patients can have. And as, there's no way to monitor that because we don't have any way to assess motor function of Parkinson patients when they're at home. So we actually got a new NIH grants to pilot this product for Parkinson patients as well. But the key here is that it's again a piece of software, same AI transformer, same thing we discussed, runs just on your iPad or iPhone. It does all the processing on your iPad or iPhone. It just uses the cameras of your iPad or your phone, iPhone. And you can do a lot of this motor function based physical assessment and can track and put personal, personalized goals. Even, uh, uh, let me show you guys another demo. So this is one set of we run in one IL, you know, this in this case, caregivers come and bring the iPads, the app runs on the iPad and people see their own digital twin. This is becoming a socialization app for older adults as well, because sometimes they see their digital twin and they start to dance in front of the iPad because uh, it just shows, you know, their stick figure in real time. Um, 
and we we saw that a lot of them were competitive so they like to compare their scores against each other and they used to come every week and even help them with uh, um, overcoming some social isolations that we see in older adults which was very encouraging for us um making going back to the presentation uh yeah and uh, right now we're working with personalized exercises based on those mobility assessment and based on the mobility deficits and risk of falls and other mobility problems, you know, and then they are all they are providing AI coaching and using generative AI to interact with older adults uh, in real time. And uh, the the system has been verified and validated against high end motion capture systems. Uh, and we are working with North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services because there is a digital health disparity, you know, and I'm sure the you guys have the same problem in California that in rural areas, people have much lack of access for routine assessment. So right now uh, in North Carolina, the governor Cooper, as part of this healthcare initiatives, they're getting grants from federal government to give laptops and iPads to these older adults in rural and underserved communities, as well as access to the broadband internet. And or app is a great exemplifier that why older adults need to have an iPad. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to, um, I'm, I'm going to skip the rest. I just want to show you guys a more, more, uh, more real world, more immediate impact of AI in healthcare and what I'm working on as a product and which is very, very exciting time for us as well. And um, yeah, I finished the presentation here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, an eye opener.